scenario, <laughs> like all these different scenarios, right? Could also be a high executive secretary woman or high executive woman in an office um, having a subservient male in her office and she kind of, you know, they have like erotic sex scenes. Like you can imagine all, I mean, I have a very, very vivid imagination. So of course I can always concoct some sort sort of filthy story within my head here. Uh, Different types of role playing and different types of scenarios, you know. (coughs) Excuse me. Um, In a relationship with two partners, one will typically play the dom role while the other will play the submissive role. A switch. Here's what we're talking about. Switches. It's an individual who shifts between the dom and submissive roles, depending on the partner and the context. Like, for instance, I have this this friend upstate who is a submissive brat. But recently, she has been, well, within the past couple years, she has been kind of topping from the bottom, like, but in a good way. So she, she and her husband are married. He's a male dom. She was his submissive. Then she was my submissive. I kind of took control over her for a little while while she was repairing some things with her husband because her husband, who's a male dom, did indeed cross her boundaries. And she felt violated by that. So um, I had, he, him and her both had asked me to take ownership over her for a while to kind of give her some womanly directive. Now, doing this... I would be talking to her, this was like a couple of years ago, and I then figured out that her her bratty, submissive mean streak in her was more of her submissive side uh, waking up a little bit and finding out she was really a switch. And I would say to her, well, have you ever tried to maybe dom someone? It seems to me that you're more of like a switch rather than a sub submissive with bratty tendencies, right? The brattiness would take over her and make her more dominant to some degree. Um, Even though she wears her heart on her sleeve and is a full submissive, but she then had her own sub and she was dominating this fella, this cross-dresser. And I was like, wow, I said, you could be a a mistress with, you know, training. So (laughs) I actually... I was giving her advice and kind of being her mentor and her coach and kind of guiding her on this path. And would you know, to this day, she is not her husband's submissive any longer, but she is subservient to other tops. Like, she will submit to the right person uh, within rules, of course, and her husband agrees to it. And then he also agrees to allow her to have her own sub, which is really interesting. So... In my humble, honest opinion, this friend of mine is a true switch. Starts out as a submissive, very good, you know, very obedient. And then, you know, she's in the lifestyle a couple of years and, you know, I can kind of see her at play parties and I can see how she's evolved. Like, you know, with BDSM, of course, it's a big journey and people are always evolving. Even me, I'm always evolving still, like learning new things like about the TMG and you know, I wish more of the newer, young, younger mistresses, you know, and doms, male doms, would kind of adhere, adhere to the old guard practices because that is traditional BDSM. That is the the foundation that started it all. <coughs> the younger generation, the next generation, have totally different rules and and sets, and they collar anybody and everybody, and their collared slaves own other slaves, and it's just, it's really fucking out of control, if you ask me. But, whatever, I don't really get involved with other people's dynamics, as long as you all practice the same thing, which again is SSC, safe, sane, and consensual, or RAC, risk-aware, consensual kink. So, back to my, my old friend, who is now a real switch. So it's kind of funny on her FetLife profile, like two years ago, I saw that she was a submissive. And then, I don't know, within the past like year or so, or last year, her profile said she was a dominant. And then now it says a switch. So it's, it's really funny. And then she writes, 
fluctuating, evolving. Um, she's also in like a wolf pack with like other, you know, submissives and other doms. They have like their little leather family, as if you would call it in old guard, old school BDSM, a leather family. Like <laughs> myself, I've been in the leather family with other dominants and other submissives because that's our little group, our clique. So it's kind of like the same thing, I guess, you know. Um, so it's kind of interesting. The dominant and submissive dynamic is often referred as a top-bottom dynamic, while the dominant partner or top is typically the one taking control in the spanking, the bonding, the whipping, or other sexual scenarios. The submissive may also maintain control by demanding the top to perform certain roles or insist on switching roles. Me, I don't really believe the submissive should be able to, to tell a dominant that. When the submissive is, you know, telling the dom what they think they should be doing, in my eyes, that's topping from the bottom. Um, if you're a true submissive and you're, like, wearing a consideration collar, a training collar, you're owned, you then should know your place by then and not direct the dominant to do something to you for your needs. Again, it's about us. It's about what we want. Of course, you know, I've had subs when I used to do pro dom sessions where um, I would say to them, all right, what kind of session are you looking for? Oh, I'm looking for a foot trampling, human foot bath, um, spanking, paddling, you know, that type of session. Okay. That I need to know, because in that type of situation, when a submissive is coming to you for a pro-dom session where you're taking money for a session, you kind of want to help them live out their fantasy. In that case, it's okay, because they're paying for a service, so you kind of want to know ahead of time what they're into, what their pain level is, if they even have one. Um, it's funny, years ago I used to have this application that I used to give to submissives when they would come for a pro-dom session. Uh, on a, what is your pain level on a scale to 1 to 10, <laughs> if you even have one? Um, some people would check off 1, some people would check off 5. I remember this one guy, he came from Maine to see me, drove like two days or whatever, spent like a thousand dollars for a weekend session and I had asked him I said oh what's your pain level and he goes oh mistress I'm into corporal punishment and my eyes lit up like a Christmas tree with 20,000 lights on it when I heard he was into corporal punishment because to me that's like pretty heavy duty stuff which means this guy was a pain slut <laughs> and what I mean by a pain slut or a masochist is somebody who really enjoys full-blown beatings, like with a jambok, which is like an elephant herding stick. This thing is fucking nasty. This thing hurts like you wouldn't believe. I've been in dungeons where I've seen other dominants like smack subs in the ass or the buttocks with that thing, and oh, pretty bad. Um, or caning, or I would have like rattan canes like soaking in like a bathtub of water to make them kind of soft and pliable. And then you have the submissive bent over the spanking bench, and then you take out the rattan canes from the water and you let the, it dry slightly. And you basically would swing this thing like a lightsaber and smack the submissive right in the buttocks with it, and it leaves such a beautiful welt um, that it's pleasing to the eye, or welting turns into bruising and vice versa. Um... But corporal punishment to me is very enjoyable, especially when I have somebody in front of me who can really take a fucking wallop beating. And I hate to say it in those terms, but to me it's kind of fun. Um, this, by them being pain sluts or into heavy-duty corporal punishment, I know that <laughs> they know the safe word, which is red. I read the submissive's body language during the pro-dom session to see if I'm beating them too hard. Um, <laughs> they also, if they blurt out the word red, I stop immediately. Or sometimes I'll even ask them during a session, what's, what's mistress's favorite word? And they're like, um, I don't know. So then I would smack them a little harder. 
What's, again, what's mistress's favorite word? I still don't know, ma'am. I said, you got it wrong. I'm not a ma'am. I'm a fucking mistress. <laughs> and, like, then I would, like, you know, spank him a little bit harder or use a dragon's tail or a signal whip and kind of, you know, hit them and split that skin wide open. Um, I've I've done it a few times where I've whipped submissives to where they were bleeding. Um, and again, they're heavy-duty masochists. They're pain sluts. They're into corporal punishment. They could really take a beating. These people must have been, like, veterans in a war or something. <laughs> they were, like, pretty, like, they could take anything and everything. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the main thing you want to do is when you're doing corporal punishment-type play, you want to do safety advice and special considerations, right? So the most important part of a BDSM type relationship is the act of consent, okay? Partners should always make sure everyone gives enthusiastic consent and outlines clear boundaries, meaning the dominant will have a set of rules. The play partner, whether it's the bottom or the submissive, um, would adhere to these rules. And even when you're doing extensive scenes like corporal punishment or bastinado with like the feet or, you know, um, heavy duty bondage and suspension type play, of course you want to have rules set in place for both parties. Meaning the submissive may even tell the dominant, well, I don't like this. I don't want that. Um, can you try not to do these things? And of course, you know, I would say yes to them. Now, it, of course, if you, once you agree upon those boundaries, then the rules are set in place and the play scene begins, right? Now, of course, as I like to say, mistresses, especially the new generation, you better listen wisely. If you have a submissive in front of you and you do not do any type of warm-up play, and you go right into heavy-duty corporal punishment, you run the risk of giving that submissive or putting them into shock, basically. And it can happen uh, where they could feel that um, they're not in a good place. They feel scared. They may shake or convulse. These are things that you do not want to happen in a, pl in a public or private play scene, for that matter. So you will, of course, adhere to the rules that both parties set in place. You will both consent to the scene and what could happen during a scene. And you also are consenting to give that submissive warm-up. Like I always like to say, I like to tenderize my meat before I play with it. So, which means you will take the submissive, you will have them you know, adhered to a cross or a spanking men's or whatever type of play you're doing. And you would kind of take your fingers or a Wartenberg wheel and kind of run it up the submissives back to kind of give them a little sensory play to kind of warm up their body a little bit to get used to, you know, what's ready to be coming next. <laughs> you can only imagine what's going to be next. Um, due to the intense nature of some of the BDSM scenes, it is also important to introduce a safe word, like I was talking about earlier. My safe word is red. Most young people like to use the word pineapple, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, to me, it really doesn't belong in BDSM. I would not never use that word, but to each his own, you know. <coughs> um, Mistress still has this terrible cough from asthma and COVID. Uh, so the boundaries can be laid out in a formal contract. Now, I've done this before, or a verbal agreement, or a more casual conversation about desires and limits. My whole idea is that when you are consenting to a heavy-duty electro-play scene, a fire-play scene, heavy-duty corporal punishment, you should always, always, always have the submissive give you consent in writing. You should also make a copy of their driver's license to attach it to their... Like, I used to do this when I worked in a dungeon. I would also ask them for their complete medical history because of the fact that most people do not like to talk about their medical history. And if you're going to do heavy-duty corporal punishment on someone, you may want to make sure they don't have a pacemaker or heart problem before you begin. 
because it could turn ugly. You could put that person into shock and cause 